you turn with me to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Verses 3 to 8 <coughs> this morning. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for this word this morning. Lord, do open our eyes to see, unite our hearts to fear your name. Strengthen us. Fill me with your spirit, Lord, to proclaim your truth clearly and compellingly. Be with us all. Work in us, Lord, for your glory and for our good and joy, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, recently I've been a little more forced to come to grips with the fact that I'm getting a bit older. I'm not too far from 50, and part of that realization has been that over, oh, the last half of last year, I started having some issues with my eyes, which I'd never had before up until, oh, I don't know, maybe two months ago, I had never had an eye exam as an adult, um, because I didn't need it, and I wasn't going to go there and have them puff anything into my eyeballs, because I don't like that. But I went... Um, and found out not much is there, you know, just a little bit magnification, nothing, even the reader glasses will, um, are are down low enough on it. But during that time, my eyes felt really tired, just really tired, and and certain things, uh, up close mainly, I I realized at one when we were in Rooted here, and it's playing catchphrase, and, you know, the lighting in this room's not good, so I'm going to say that, but that little window... Paul had to read me every word that I was supposed to say because I could not read through that window because it was the lighting was really bad. (laughs) But things haven't been as clear as they used to be, mainly because of the lighting, again. um, So I I looked into different ways to reduce eye strain, um, even ways to stay off screens, but I use them so often. Um, So much of my work is done with a screen, and so that became pretty much impossible to do. So it became an endeavor endeavor to to mitigate the effects of the screen. Talking with a few people, pastor's group, Greg, and some others, I ended up with blue light glasses, not the blue blockers that you all saw in those old commercials kind of thing, but blue light glasses with this very slight magnification in them. And it has been such a difference for me. My eyes aren't working nearly as hard to focus, and, and the light is not affecting them nearly as bad, and, and they're, therefore, they haven't felt tired and painful. And it's amazing that just some tiny lenses can make that much of a difference. A little change in what I look through has done so much, and honestly, that makes me think about our text this morning, because in it... Throughout this entirety of this text, there's a perspective that Paul puts forth that is filtered through a lens, and it's a lens of grace. It's not a blue light lens, it's a lens of God's grace, and it's compelling. And I hope that this morning, I help us not only to see that lens, but actually to long for it to be in our lives. So we look at these next six verses, we'll do so under two broad ideas. That's fellowship in Christ and then affection of Christ. And then looking at all of that, I hope that we will see what it is that ties it all together, and that's the gospel of grace. That's the the amazing grace of God in Christ Jesus. So verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, 
always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So we looked at the introduction last week, and here's Paul's opening prayer, and it's thanksgiving. It's, it's thanksgiving directed to God. It's an expression of gratitude to God that Paul quickly expresses whenever the church at Philippi comes to his heart and his mind. You see, Paul knows that the relationship he has with that church is not because of his personality or anything else along those lines. It's because of the work of God. And so he gives thanks to God for them. And as simple as this may be, it tells us that Paul's focus, that really what is most important in his life, what's on his heart and mind most often is the Lord and the work of God's grace. And that, therefore, affects not only how he views life and relationships, but it also affects his prayers. So let's look at this prayer. One of the first things I think that you notice here is that that this use of language like all, always, every. It's very strong. It's, it's definitive language. And when you think about how, what, how Paul wrote about prayer elsewhere, you know, Colossians 4, be devoted to prayer, or, or always be in prayer, and the Philippians know that, know of Paul's devotion, that's great encouragement to them. Because they know that they're being prayed for, that Paul is thanking God for them. But what else do we see? First, now, kind of re- repeated here, we've already mentioned this, but, but when Paul remembers the Philippians and he prays for them, he is filled with thanksgiving for them. He's filled with thanksgiving for these people. So his remembrance sparked not only prayer, but actual gratitude towards the Lord. Again, this reflects a God-centered life. And I think the sad reality, though, for most of us is that all too often when we remember fellow believers, we don't always do so with thankfulness. Maybe we think about what they have done for us, and maybe we're a little thankful for that, or we think about what they've done to us more in a critical manner. However, with this Godward perspective that Paul has, with a lens of grace, we will see and be thankful for what God has done in their lives. Now, now listen, Paul, Paul knows full well that not everything is perfect in Philippi. He, he knew that about the church in Corinth. Corinth was a bit of a mess, and it, it had a laundry list of issues. But listen to 1 Corinthians 1.4. This is the start of a letter where he rebukes them pretty significantly. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. You see, having eyes that have a lens of grace helps us not first to focus on sin and other distressing issues, but actually on the work of God's grace in people's lives. It doesn't take away from a need to admonish and encourage and rebuke and correct, but it does certainly help in our approach in how we do that. If we come in with a thankful heart and a gracious heart, that really changes how we come at someone because we're not actually going at them. (laughs) We're coming to them in love, correcting. So second, he writes that he prays for you all. Paul prays for the church, for all of it. He doesn't leave people out. This is not some hyperbole for Paul. It, It is the labor of a shepherd caring for his sheep. Now, I'm not 100% positive on this, but I'm pretty positive that Mark Dever, who's the pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist in in Washington, D.C., said that next to the Bible, the church directory is his most important book for church ministry because he and the elders labor and pray through that directory on a weekly and monthly basis, lifting up the people in the church They're praying for needs and for spiritual maturity. This is vital. Folks, we must be a praying church. Third, though, Paul uses the word translated uh, prayer twice. 
And it has this connotation of not just praying, but praying for an urgent need. It is supplication. In chapter 4, verse 6, Paul exhorts the church not to be anxious, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It's taking our requests to the Lord. Paul didn't only give thanks for them, but he also sought to pray for their needs. And what this tells us is that as we remember one another, we, we pray, we give thanks, but we also take one another to the throne of grace. And imagine if you knew that not only was the pastor, but various other and multiple other people in the church were giving thanks for you on a regular basis and lifting up your needs in prayer. That's a wonderful thought. That's encouragement. Taking people uh, in the name, up to the Father in the name of Jesus for mercy and grace to help in time of need. Well, fourth, and this I think is easy to read over, but he writes of doing all of this with joy. With joy. Here's the first of 14 times that we hear of joy in this letter. And I think a good question for us is, is to ask, What's the source of Paul's joy? Why is he able to do this with joy? Well, the, the next verse really tells us. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul is, is absolutely overjoyed that from the moment the Philippians heard and believed the gospel, they've been partners with him. They've been partners with him. And this is similar to what we read in 3 John, verse 4, where John writes this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. To see those you have invested time into, walking in the truth, partnering in the gospel is a delight. There might be no greater feeling for a parent than to see their child love Jesus. I don't care if my kids are successful businessmen. I care that they love Jesus. And there might be no greater joy for a pastor or shepherd than to see the people God has given him charge over walking with Jesus, loving him, pursuing, not, not in perfection, but pursuing in the right direction. Pursue righteousness, love, faith, and peace along with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Now, that word partnership that he uses in verse 5, it's a translation of probably one of the more familiar Greek words, one that you've heard before, koinonia. Most everyone's heard koinonia and, and seen it, and it, it's translated often as fellowship or partnership or participation or community or more, but we need to consider what this Greek word encompasses because none of those English words do it full justice. That's, that's a difficulty with translation often. Now, <coughs> excuse me, koinonia definitely involves friendship. We know that. There's, there's relationship there. Paul feels a, a closeness in relationship to the Philippian church. There's friends, and we'll see more of this in a few minutes when we look at verses 7 and 8. There's also affection, and we're going to see that again in just a few moments. And there's community as well. But I think what Paul is focusing on here is centered around something more specific and, and probably, honestly, a bit more significant. It's koinonia in the experience of grace. Koinonia in the experience of grace. There is a commonality in that they are all now saints at peace with God. Though they were once rebels fighting against the reign and rule of the Lord, they are now in covenant relationship with the Lord of the universe. And so, as we take this a step further, not just partners in grace, but it's actually around the gospel and advancing the gospel in the world. We see that in verse 7, that they are all partakers, he writes, they are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. See, Paul would consider this fellowship in the gospel. We have fellowship in the gospel with one another, in the work of the gospel, not only in proclaiming it, but seeing it be more real in our own lives as we preach the gospel to ourselves daily. It's a fellowship in grace based on and formed because of the grace of God. 
D.A. Carson wrote this. He said, the heart of true fellowship is self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. Christian fellowship is self-sacrificing conformity to the gospel. Now, there, there may be overtones of warmth and intimacy, but the heart of the matter is this shared vision of what is of transcendent importance, a vision that calls forth our commitment. So when Paul gives thanks with joy because of the Philippians' partnership in the gospel or fellowship in the gospel, he is thanking God that these brothers and sisters in Christ, from the moment of their conversion, he writes, from the first day until now, rolled up their sleeves and got involved in the advance of the gospel. Folks, that's the heart of our koinonia. It's a desire and a working towards conformity to Christ in all things and rolling up our sleeves and getting involved in the work of the gospel. But there's also another reason that Paul gives for his joy in his prayers, and it's really a continuation of this. But verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's a beautiful verse. We've all probably heard it many times. But I want to read it a little differently, and I'm actually going to take out the and I am, okay? And simply have it flow like this. Paul says, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing. The God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I don't believe there's a need for a sentence break between five and six. What Paul is confident of is their continuing in partnership in the gospel because God began that work in them and He will complete it. Now, so often this verse is uh, interpreted and, and, and taken in, in the realm of personal confidence. The idea that God began the work of salvation in me, the work of sanctification, and He will complete that work in me. That's valid, okay? That, that's, we, we find that throughout Scripture. But that's a secondary interpretation of this text. It's not primary. Primarily, Paul is talking about this partnership in the gospel, that God began that work of their partnership with grace, in grace with him in the advancement of the gospel throughout Europe and Asia. And he's confident that God will carry on that good work. You know, we see that throughout, we, we see this everywhere. And one commentator wrote, he said, as true as that individualistic application of the text is, it misses the connection of God's good work to koinonia. The good work that God began was the formation of a corporate entity, the partnership, the, the koinonia in the gospel. Those who belong to this koinonia enjoy a friendship deeper than the blood relationship of brothers and sisters on the basis of their mutual participation in the saving work of Christ announced by the gospel. Their koinonia as friends is also a koinonia as partners in the work of proclaiming the gospel. So our fellowship, our partnership together as believers, it's in the gospel. That, that's what roots it together. That's what ties us together. I've said this before, but in my life as a believer, there are a number of people that became deep friends that I never would have been friends with apart from the gospel. Because at first blush, they were not people I wanted to hang out with. But that fellowship in the gospel changes it. The gospel forms it, brings it about, and we labor together then in the work of proclaiming the gospel. And Paul was so grateful for this partnership. And he also knew a reality. He knew that for them, for the Philippian church, there were threats. There were threats from without. We see this in Colossians 1, 28. But there were also threats from within. Colossians, or Philippians 4, where um, he urges Euodia and Syntyche to, 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 to reconcile, to deal with things rightly. Those things threatened the fellowship and the partnership. But he was confident in God and his grace to hold that partnership together. And so this verse, I think, gives us such hope. 
God is steadfast in love. He's faithful to His covenant. He's faithful to the Son. So, in all of this, Paul can give thanks, and he can pray with joy, even as he prays for very specific and and quite often, I'm sure, some pretty distressing things, especially as he's in a prison, either in Rome or Ephesus, and he can't be there with them. But he has confidence and assurance in God that God is at work without fail in the lives of his people. So, how much hope does this give us in our day-to-day living and in our prayers for one another when we truly know and believe in the God who is there? When we believe in that God, it transforms our lives and it transforms our prayers. You know, we don't just believe something like Romans 8, 38, and 39 for ourselves where it says, Paul writes, (coughs) for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's confident of that in the lives of the Philippian church. And so he prays, he gives thanks, he prays for them with joy because they are partners in the gospel with him. Well, then Paul moves on to talk further about his relationship, not not, not just about their fellowship and partnership in the gospel, but actually the depth of the relationship he has with this church, the depth of feeling that he has for them. Look at verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Again, this is very strong, and it's even emotive language. Paul uses a word here that he will use ten times throughout this letter. And it typically deals with our interior thoughts, our our attitudes and feelings, which, which motivate our actions. And it's the word that we have translated here as feel. It's right for me to feel this way. It's variously translated as feel or think or mind or agree or concern. All of those are ways that that word is translated in this letter. And you'll be able to see as we study this common connection. But what Paul is saying when he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you, and that's about all of them, When it comes to mind, this deep affection, this deep love he has for them, he just says, it's right. It's the right thing. It's the way that it ought to be. There's a sense in which what he is feeling is, is what he is, he's almost morally obligated to feel. In a sense, it would be wrong if he felt any other way for this church. Anything else would be improper, and if you carried it a little further, it would actually be disparaging the work of God's grace in their lives if he didn't feel this affection for them. So what motivated this thinking and this feeling in Paul? What's the ground of it? Because, you know, I think it's, this, is, this is a real deep affection. And it, it's one thing to be thankful for brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, people you ran into, maybe people that were at a church you were at in, in an old city or something like that, and you just, you're thankful for them, but you don't feel this, this depth. You know, it, it's another thing to hold someone deep in your heart, to have that deep affection. And when I think about how to answer that, I, I think back over the years of gospel work that I've been involved in. And the people I have labored with day in and day out in ministry, there's a difference in the affection I have for them. You know, it's, it's a different type of relationship, and I rejoice when things go well, and I, I've got this, I can kind of pick up with so many of them right where we left off. And so I rejoice when things go well. It, it really pains me to see things not going well. And to even see some who I labored with seeming now to to deconstruct and and start to walk away from the faith. And that's painful. 
because there was this deep connection in partnership in the gospel. And so Paul here holds the Philippians in his heart. And that's more than mere sentiment. This is not a sappy statement. It's not a Hallmark card intro or anything like that. This is more along the lines of someone being absolutely willing to give everything for another. And it's because they have been partakers with him of grace. And that that word partakers there, it, it means to have fellowship with. It's like with koinonia is, is, is how it is. They've been partakers with him both in his imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And that word imprisonment, you know, it's translated there as that it literally means chains or bonds or fetters. And so uh, on a side note here, this means that likely what Paul's imprisonment was like was that he was chained to a guard 24-7 had no privacy. He had some freedoms. He had freedoms to receive visitors, and he could do some of his, his ministry work um, and, and do what he called him to do. But I also just want you to imagine the effect that that would have on the dude chained to Paul all the time. The captive audience that Paul would have makes you wonder when he says, those of the Praetorian Guard also greet you. <laughs> saying all the guys that have been hanging out with me because they've been forced to they're now your brother in Christ. I, I, one day, I'll love to meet the guards who guarded Paul in heaven. But the Philippians, <coughs> excuse me, the Philippians weren't actually in chains with Paul. He was in a whole different place, imprisoned. But they were, quote, in it with him, weren't they? They aided in his defense of the gospel. And that, that idea of a defense of the gospel could be taken in a, in a really broad manner, kind of this whole idea of his, his work of ministry and defending the gospel and proclaiming it throughout the world. But based on 116, where Paul writes that he's in prison, he's in prison literally for the defense of the gospel. That seems to be a more technical sense of being on trial It seems that this defense of the gospel here is referring to their help in whatever way they aided in his defense, which was likely financially, which we know they've done, but certainly also in prayer, which we are not to slight in any way, shape, or form. And if you look at the end of the letter at 4, 14 to 18, you see how thankful Paul is for this partnership. This church in Philippi, though it went through some pretty difficult times of its own, has been given the grace of giving. Sacrificial giving for Paul and the ministry of the gospel. And so by joining with Paul through their giving and prayers, they also showed that they were were partners with him in all aspects of gospel ministry. And so with all of that, there's no wonder why he holds them in his heart. Because they were in it all with him from the very beginning. He was not alone. He had faithful partners in the whole church. One commentator said, wrote this, sharing in God's grace brought them all together in the first place, and sharing in God's grace kept them all together. You know, it's when, you, when God calls you into his kingdom, you don't just sit and you're done. You continue to labor for the work of the kingdom. You're a servant of Christ Jesus, as Paul wrote at the very beginning of this letter. You're a slave to Christ for His glory and for the good of those within the church and those outside of the church to whom we proclaim the gospel. Folks, but not only were they sharing in Paul's experience in this way, they were going through it in their own right. If you look at 1, 29 and 30, Paul wrote, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Now, that'll be a fun one to really dissect in a while. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw that I had and now hear that I still have. They are undergoing the same conflict as Paul. Enemies of the gospel are seeking to wreak havoc in their lives and impede the message of grace. But Paul holds them in his heart. And he makes sure that they understand that he truly means that. 
Like, it, it is one thing to, to say to people, yeah, you're really dear to me. And then it's like 30 years before you hear from them again or something like that. Or um, I'll pray for you. And then that never happens. He actually says, for God is my witness. Paul calls on the one who cannot lie, <laughs> who knows the hearts of all men, says, he's my witness, how deeply I hold you in my heart. It's serious. Paul is not exaggerating the depth of his love, the depth of his thankfulness for these believers. The, the grace of God in their lives has left a massive impression on his life. It's a mark of indelible grace. And he yearns for them all. He longs, he strongly desires to be with them. And he says, it is with the affection of Christ Jesus. With the affection of Christ Jesus. Now the word affection there actually refers to the inward parts of our body, the, the bowels, the, 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 the visceral part. And those were believed to function in, in, in the realm of compassion and love and affection. And, and we can understand that, right? We know that oftentimes we could say, I, I, I just feel deep in my gut for somebody or for something, or, or you, you get those nerves in your gut, things like that. Like, we, we can understand that feeling. And at Matthew 9, 36, we, we read this about Jesus. It says, when he saw the crowds, <clears throat> he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus sees these crowds of people and they're wandering and lost. And he feels it inside. He has compassion on them because they're, they're, they're lost and helpless, sheep without a shepherd. They're going to die without the message of the gospel. And the compassion that compelled Jesus in that situation, it's the same feeling that Paul says he has for the Philippian church. He writes elsewhere in his letters that he's controlled or constrained by the love of Christ. And he is because he as a believer is united to Christ. We're going to read later in Philippians where it says, have this mind among you which is yours in Christ Jesus. Because we are vitally connected to Christ. We yearn with that affection of Christ. One commentator wrote, he said, Paul's life in Christ Jesus brings all his relationships within the sphere of Christ's love. Paul's relationships were never only on the human level human person with human person. No, they always involve the co-inherence of Christ living within Paul, Paul living within Christ, Christ living within the church, and the church living within Christ. That union with Christ, that, that commonality that we have in grace is what pulls everything together. So I hope in, in these six verses you can see how Paul was gripped by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Gripped by the gospel. Gripped by that work. His, his whole life. Okay, re remember who Paul was again. An enemy of the gospel. His whole life had been reoriented completely around Jesus and the riches of the gospel. It changed how Paul lived. It changed how he taught, how he prayed, how he longed, how he suffered, because he was given new lenses. What happened in Acts? The scales fell off. And in, in a metaphorical way, he was given lenses of grace, lenses of the gospel to see the world. He no longer looked through performance and pedigree, but through the grace and love of Christ. 
He came to know the power and goodness and faithfulness of his Savior and Lord, and he longed to live in the manner of Christ. He longed to reflect his Savior. He wanted to truly be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Folks, there's so much in just six verses. So much good, so much that draws us deeper into the experience of Christ into the one who gave his own life for people who had done nothing but rebelled against him. The heart of grace, looking through the lens of grace, really, he looked through and, and saw these Philippians, and he looked for his, th- th- those lenses would see, where is the evidence of God's grace at work in their life? And I'm going to give thanks for that, and I'm going to continue to pray for them. It's a beautiful way to live looking first for reasons for thanksgiving and delight rather than critique and correction. But listen, it's not easy. It is a whole lot easier to be critical because that feeds our self-righteousness. If I'm critical of you, then I'm better than you, and hey, yep, that's all good. It's not a good way to live. Dennis Johnson wrote this. He said, When fellow Christians' offenses and defects loom large in our minds, it's because we've lost sight of the marvel that all of us who belong to Jesus are partners in the gospel and fellow recipients of his abundant grace. To love our neighbors as ourselves and especially our Christian brothers and sisters extensively and intensively, we need a source of love deeper than our own puny hearts. We need the affection of Christ Jesus, imparted by His Holy Spirit, residing in us, constantly turning our gaze upward to the Lord who showed us compassion, and then outward to those who need to experience His compassion through us. Folks, my prayer for us and for me is that we put on the right lenses. Lenses that marvel at the grace of God. Lenses that marvel at the gospel. Lenses that marvel at that work in each other's lives. Lenses that give thanks. Lenses full of the affection of Christ Jesus. Folks, let us regain our proper sight to know the power of the cross, to know the power of the gospel. Let us all examine our eyes by the power of the Spirit and pray for the lenses of grace. Let's pray. Father, we we do long for this. Lord, I pray that the compelling nature of your grace in our lives <coughs> would change us, would grow us. Lord, that we would just see and, and know a sweeter fellowship and grace as we partner in the gospel and marvel at your work in each other's lives. Be at work for your glory and for our good and joy. In Christ's name, amen.